Oh, you're clicking it. Okay. Yeah. If it's working all right. All right. Good afternoon. Testing one, two. Uh, it's Ruth Harmon in the room. Okay, we can start because I saw you go into the bathroom a little while ago. I wanted to make sure that we were all ready. Uh, welcome to this special event of Class 8. Um, I really appreciate all you showing up. And before I introduce my brother, which is something I don't do every day, uh, I'm going to try to make it as um, succinct as possible. But I wanted to remind you of a couple of things. Um, when you leave here, if you wouldn't mind signing a ro roster that's outside by the books. And um, I believe that there's a few copies left of materials that may be of interest. Uh, most of you have been familiar with the work of Alejandro for some time. And I basically wanted to see if I could share with you things that are not on the uh, online internet uh, biographies that recount his journeys from, I guess, Champaign, Illinois, to Austin, Texas, and then through to Hopkins. Um, and recently, uh, he has completed a number of years at the University, well, Princeton University Sociology Department, where he is chair. Um, there's so many little things that I will um, omit here for you, but I did want to mention that he recently was uh, recognized by the National Academy of Education, and he's a past member of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, he's now um, working to um, perhaps make the University of Miami a little bit better in the Department of Sociology, which I think he will mention uh, when he comes up here uh, at the end of his lecture. But in any case, I wanted to also give you a little bit of a sense of what it was like uh, for us before we arrived to the United States City. I guess because of him, it was his fault that I'm here. <laughs> uh, he was the first one in the family to be persecuted. And uh, he had to be brought to the United States uh, because of all of his friends being picked up and subjected to re-education camps, which were, I think, what was awaiting for the rest of us. So he, in a sense, led the way uh, as we all came to Miami in the 1960-61 period. And after about a year of separation, I met him and my father at a local grocery store where they uh, came to meet with the people that brought my sister and I to Miami. I'll never forget that moment uh, in terms of the toughest moments of the exile, which he has recounted in some of his works. Uh, besides, I guess, focusing on immigrant in America and the latest edition that has some new insights that he wants to share with you, um, he also had a book called City on the Edge that was recognized as the Bert Rubin book of American Sociological Association of Urban Sociology that if you're interested in the interplay between Havana and Miami and how those two histories go back and forth in time, it's written in sort of like a very different academic, non-academic style that I think a lot of you would enjoy. Um, I do not want to go into any more kudos but just what's online, but I wanted to mention that we'll have a little bit of time after his talk on Immigrant America, and I wanted to once again welcome you to one of the many, I would say, conferences that I, we hope to make possible for this and other audiences um, at the University of Georgia. Uh, with great pleasure that I bring onto the stage my dear brother, Alejandro, Eduardo Cortes Cortada. Thank you. Who's working for me? It should be better. It's fine. I can just talk to you. Huh? It's loud enough. Okay. Stay with it. Okay. Thank you. 
thank you, Pedro. I uh, <laughs> introducing the, the number of audiences, but seldom by my my own kin. Uh, so this is a singular pleasure. It's not the f it's not the first time uh, that I have lectured at the University of Georgia, uh, and uh, it's that is uh, what it's about five years ago since uh, last time. So it's a pleasure to be back and uh, uh, and to share with you some more recent material and perhaps uh, review. Uh, re review with you the, uh, the situation concerning uh, uh, immigration and immigration policy in this country, uh, a topic that in the past barely touched the state of Georgia, uh, which was seen something that happened in the southwest or in the northeast or in Florida, but that now is very current here. So it is I think it is appropriate perhaps to discuss it and bring to Hoff to and, and uh, let you know what uh, uh, has happened re more recently and also discuss with you some of the points that I would like to advance that, uh, that may be in some ways contentious or subject to debate. Uh, this material, uh, let me put a plug before starting, this comes from the, uh, uh, the final chapter or the of the fourth edition of my book, Immigrant America, a Portrait. There are some, I think, some copies outside. In 2012, President Obama promulgated by decree a temporary state of the campaign against the children of immigrants. We know about the DACA of 2012. In the first year of the program, we had about 400,000 applicants that were allowed to stay in the US, although still more than half of the undocumented youth under age 30 uh, remain ineligible. At that time, uh, the Homeland uh, Security Secretary, Janet, Na Janet Napolitano, proclaimed the end of indiscriminate deportation campaigns, announcing back in 2011 that henceforth cases would be reviewed on an individual basis. Although in 2012, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, deported another over 400,000 individuals, a record high, and has continued do doing so up to this very year. The plummeting of unauthorized uh, immigration, primarily from Mexico, prompted by the recession of 2008-10 and the consequent drying up of labor supplies to agriculture and other labor intensive sectors of the American economy, prompted then the Obama administration to reactivate the temporary visa program, the so-called H-2A program, on a massive scale. So that by 2014, the situation in this country was nothing short of a schizophrenia, with agricultural interests clamoring for the same type of worker that ICE was deporting. Uh, so, and the US government setting up a revolving door at the border in which, on the one hand, Mexican workers were thrown out uh, of the country by ICE, and on the other hand, they were welcomed as H2 and H2A recipients for agriculture. The same, of, often the same people uh, coming in in this kind of revolving door. Calls for comprehensive immigration reform, reform to solve this esch schizophrenic situation have long been heard, but they have been routinely neutralized by intransigent opposition, as we know, of conservatives in Congress against, quote, rewarding lawbreakers. Only the punishing Hispanic vote against uh, this candidate, mostly Republican candidate in, in the 2012 election, began convincing some Republican Party stalwarts to move away from their prior intransigence, lest they lose another election next time. Realities underneath are more complex. While clamoring for a ready supply of foreign labor, chambers of commerce and associations of farmers and ranchers barely raise a finger in the past to adopt, a, to stop the border enforcement and the deportation campaigns. Although these associations, the farmers and ranchers associations, did not say so publicly, many of these interests view the current American immigration system as not really broken. Not really broken. Because since unauthorized immigration provided these groups with a steady supply of low cost and especially docile labor. So often economies, uh, I, that is a, a scholar tied into this interest, they do not mention it in public, but behind the, behind the scenes, the, immigra the immigration system works. It's not really broken. 
is still feeding this for the providing this uh, a ready supply of uh, this kind of uh, docile labor. The contradictions of American immigration policy today represent the latest episode of that ambivalence toward immigration that has marked the history of the nation. There is no small irony if you examine American immigration history in the contrary portrayals of immigration that, it, that consistently is reviled and attacked when it is taking place and then celebrated after a period of time, after a generation or so, when the original immigrant has pa have passed from the scene and its descendants now have acquired the necessary vo voice to reivindicate the achievements of their parents. Happens all the time. Italians, Irish, uh, Poles were reviled and attacked in their time, and then eventually they were celebrated as part of the American dream, as part and uh, integral, co integral uh, uh, contributors to the success of the nation. But this cycle of negative and positive stereotyping only skims the surface uh, uh, of the phenomenon of immigration. And that is because these contradictory images emerge only in the realm of public opinion where serious understanding of what is taking place underneath, what is taking place, that what is driving these realities is not known. The well entrenched public opinion view in America is that immigration is a consequence of the initiative of migrants themselves to come in search of a better life. They are allowed to settle because of the laxness of government and a tolerant attitude by the natives. But if such an attitude were to disappear and the government were to, to tighten its controls, immigration would certainly go away. These views are wrong. Imm immigrant flows are not initiated solely by the desires and the dreams of people in other countries, but also by the designs and the interests of well-organized groups in the receiving country, primarily employers. Up to a point, public opinion to, uh, up to immigration can play into the hands of these interests by maintaining the newcomers in a position of, of permanent vulnerability. Similarly, governments are not omnipotent in the regulation of immigration. In particular, government attempts at reversing flows that are well established do not generally succeed uh, in, in accomplishing their goals because of the resistance of the networks that are created between sending and receiving countries and also among the immigrants and, uh, among, and their employers. So in this talk, what I would aim at is at teasing these rather complex dynamics that we face today in order to lay out the basis to, to, uh, to for a more a sounder understanding of the origins of contemporary immigration and also of viable policies toward, uh, toward the present situation. And to do so, we must examine the interplay between the two sets, two sets of forces that I just mentioned. First, the surface, the surface level of policy debates and shifting currents of public opinion. And second, the underlying realities of the political economy of this nation. And that's what I would try to do in the uh, remaining of my, re remainder of my time here. So let's, the f first thing to look at is what are the public ideologies of immigration? How is, how is immigration understood and reacted to in <coughs> the general? Uh, voting public. The general perception of the foreign population among the native-born majority in America is not grounded in an understanding of the historical linkages between the United States and the countries of origin or by knowledge of the economic and social forces that drive the phenomenon. The public view uh, is guided instead by surface impressions, by impressions. When foreign accents and faces are few, they, are, they can be ignored. However, when they grow in number uh, and concentrate, especially concentrate in visible spaces, they trigger increasing apprehension. Natives are, po are put on the defensive, fearing that their way of life and their control on the, lever the levers of, of political and economic power will be lost to the newcomers. And this is the sentiment expressed in familiar outcries in public radio and other uh, media such as the, quote, the end of white America, the mongrelization of the race, the rise of Mexifornia, or 
uh, in more academic terms, the Hispanic challenge. Policies that stem from these fears have followed two basic paths, to exclude the newcomers or to assimilate them as, fast as, for, as far as possible. Exclude them or assimilate them. These two positions define what I would call, what I would, I would uh, submit to you are the two great ideologies of toward immigration in the country today. They have in common that since neither of them is rooted in an understanding of the underlying forces at play, their transformation into policy leads to consequences that are commonly, as we will see, the opposite of what it was intended. So policies that are implemented and lead to the opposite consequences of what is aimed at. Thanks very much. The first ideology that uh, the may be labeled intransigent nativism, intransigent nativism, which seeks to stop all or most immigration, to expel unauthorized immigrants, and to put remaining ones on notice that they occupy a second class position ineligible for the privilege of Americans, for the privileges and the rights of American citizens. This ideology of intransigent nativism regist have registered over time some notable successes such as the passage in 1994 of Proposition 187, the Save Our State, or SOS proposition in California, the passage in 2004 of Proposition 200 in Arizona, a kindred measure dubbed Protect Arizona Now, and a plethora of other state laws and local ordinances in 2006. At the federal level, this ideology found expression in the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, or IRIRA, of uh, 1996, the and, and the anti-immigrant provisions attached to the 1996 Federal Welfare Reform Bill. The, recent, the rush of recent uh, state-level legislation in such states as Arizona, Alabama, Georgia, and Utah have sought to make life prohibitively difficult for unauthorized immigrants thereby forcing them to self-deport. Much of this legislation has been struck down in the courts as an infringement of the exclusive federal powers to regulate and control immigration. Nevertheless, the announcement and the early application in states such as Arizona and Alabama did trigger a mass departure of Mexican and Central American workers, thereby creating major crises in those states' agricultural and service industries. That outcome was entirely predictable, and it points once again to the consequences of policies that tend to be guided by superficial sentiments rather than by underlying uh, realities. So, so much for the time being for this fir first ideology that again I would call intransigent nativism. The second one may be ushered by this quote from Ronald Ons. Ronald Ons is a Jewish American billionaire uh, who lives in California and who uh, in 1998 sponsored a bill called the English for the Children uh, initiative uh, that put an end to bilingual education uh, in that state. This second ideology that is very well captured by uh, this quote by, by Mr. Ons is less radical than the first. We can call it forced assimilationism. Uh, it does look at the past of the country, at the history, but less to find the origins of contemporary immigration than to search, uh, than to search for ways in which prior immigration flows were separated from their cultures and languages and integrated into the American mainstream. According to this view, uh, which is very well uh, represented by ONS, the country's success in absorbing so many foreigners in the past is, has been due to its relentless hostility to the perpetuation of cultural enclaves and, the, and to the immersion of foreign, chil uh, foreign children into an English-only environment 
that made them Americans or monolingual Americans uh, in the course of a few generations. Indeed, the United States is a veritable cementary of languages. Nowhere else in, in, in the world there had been a country in which more different, in which more, more languages have been spoken and nowhere else have those languages disappeared so fast. So even today, out of 320 uh, million, um, uh, that is a, tw a population of about 320 million, about 90% of that population speaks only one language, English, and the remaining are either ch often child immigrants or their uh, children. Uh, in, in the United States, the most varied linguistic backgrounds from German to Italian, from Chinese to Spanish, have disappeared in a monolingual world in the course of three generations. Assimilationists, of the that is as exemplified in that earlier quote, wants the future to mirror that past as a proven way to restore unity and peace. And just as the Yiddish speaking mothers, uh, the, like that of Mr. Unz, had to leave their language and culture behind, the expectation is that today should, the same should be done by Mexican immigrants and Vietnamese refugees today, and not others. Though less traumatic than the effects of nativist exclusionary campaigns, this second ideology forced assimilationism also has important consequences, and I would submit to you they are mostly negative. Policies derived from this ideology uh, delegitimize the culture and the language of immigrant parents, thus encouraging the phenomenon that we have known to be as dissonant acculturation. By instilling in second generation kids the sense that their linguistic heritage uh, is inferior and therefore should be abandoned, this ideology drives a wedge across generations, weakening parental authority and the efforts of parents, immigrant parents, to protect their children against the dangers confronting them in schools and in the streets. A second consideration is the changing position of the United States in the world economy. <coughs> in, a in a new global order in which economic, political, and cultural ties bind nations ever closer, it is not clear that the rapid extinction of foreign languages in America is in the interest of individuals or in the interest of the country as a whole. In an increasingly interdependent world system, the existence of pools of Americans able to communicate fluently in English plus another language represents not a threat to cultural integration, but a resource and a source of enlightenment for individuals and for communities alike. Despite being grounded on reflections on the country's past, this ideology of forced assimilationism, uh, such as in, including Engli uh, the English immersion policies championed by Mr. Ons, are ultimately reactionary. They reflect a wish to restore the country to its state at the beginning of the last century, of the 20th century, not as it must be in a new millennium after it emerged as the center of the, uh, of, the of the global system. In the process, all assimilationism, that is a term people, uh, that, is forced, uh, the, that is forced the loss of languages and cultures, undermines the very forces of parental authority and ambition that can make a difference in guiding second generation kids around the major obstacles they confront in schools and streets and towards success and, and productive citizenship. So the two, ideo the two ideologies that I have uh, referred to, uh, uh, that I have described to you up, up, up to this point, are those that resonate with the general population. However, the interesting thing is that they seldom succeed in their intended goals, leading to a host of contradictions. And reasons for the outcome why these ideologies when put into, into practice, into policies, sort of blow up and leads to, lead to contradictions that were not expected uh, is because of two sets of forces that are at play and that are not understood at the surface where these, where these cries are made in public and so on. So let's review them. Let's see what are the forces that lead to these contradictions 
when these ideologies are put into practice. There is a fundamental disconnect, disconnect between the attitudes and actions of immigration opponents and critics and, and the structural importance of immigration for key sectors of the American economy. That situation is portrayed graphically in this diagram. On the left, you have the ideologies that I have described up to now, and on the right, you have the realities of the American political economy in terms of demands for labor. In the, in the American labor market, demand exists for labor at the top of the labor market for engineers, scientists, programmers, and other professionals in short supply in the nation, and at the bottom, for agricultural, construction, and service workers, also in short supply for labor-intensive industries. Today, highly skilled workers come primarily through the H-1B program uh, for, temporary, which for temporary professionals and so on, while manual workers, until recently, had to break the border and come clandestinely. More increasingly, now they are coming under uh, under a massively expanded temporary H-2 program for laborers. But both modes of arrival for professionals at the top and for, for um, unskilled and semi-skilled workers at the bottom today have in common the lack of a, of a legal basis for permanent settlement. This insecure legal status for all immigrants coming recently is ultimately, of course, beneficial to their employers who can use it to extract greater compliance and higher productivity from their foreign workers, whether they are engineers or uh, ranch hands. A dissatisfied or contentious Indian engineer does not get his, res his H-1B residence permit renewed for another three years. A militant Mexican agricultural worker is easily dismissed and if necessary, is turned over to ICE for deportation. This favorable situation on, on, the, par on the part of the, of the really powerful interests depend dependent on immigration and making use of foreign labor is undoubtedly one of the reasons why chambers of commerce and other employer organizations have not been at the forefront of calls for immigration reform. The continuation of the status quo depends, however, on, on the outcome of the clash between the economic benef benefits of immigration that are privatized by firms and hiring this, this uh, labor and the costs that are socialized. Um, costs of uh, migration assume three main forms. First, greater competition for native-born workers at both the high and low ends of the labor market. Second, a sense of discomfort among the general population because of a growing foreign presence. In class terms, neither economic elites nor the upper, mid upper middle classes are negatively affected by migration because a migration provides them with a reliable labor, labor supply for their firms and for their homes these days. Instead, it is the native working class, uh, the Native American working class living in close proximity to a rising foreign presence that manifests the greater sense of unease and discontent. This feeling of becoming foreigners in their own land and the resulting calls to, quote, rescue America for Americans or take back our country resonate most at that level, at the level of the American working class, not at the level of the upper middle classes or employer class. It's at the, at the level, at the popular level. That's where you can see the, where these ideologies that uh, that you see in the left-hand side become uh, uh, more uh, attractive uh, and resonate more. Third, the third uh, negative consequence uh, of immigration is that the lack of legal rights makes, many, makes members of the undocumented population highly vulnerable to exploitation, crime, and other social problems. Firms that employ uh, this, this migrant labor assume no responsibility for these problems, nor for the broader discontent that is created by a large foreign population. Discontent among uh, natives, however, can reach such a pitch as to threaten 
the economic benefits for migration by provoking mass political mobilization as has happened in the past. Hence, the disconnect that you see in this figure has clear class undertones with powerful actors in the American economy lining up on the right side, that is in terms of supporting immigration, and substantial elements of the native working class supporting anti-immigrant anti -immigrant intransigence on the left. The structural importance and the strategic role of migration, or the strategic role that migration play in the industries that are dependent on it have led these industries to an articular and powerful defense of their interests. It is broadly recognized that American agriculture, for example, could not survive without foreign labor. There would be no agriculture in the country without, uh, a, without uh, foreign workers to pick the crops. And at the other end of the continuum, to, not, not it, to emphasize the fact that, it's not, that immigration is a phenomenon that occurs not only at the bottom of the labor market, at the other end of the continuum, um, high-tech firms like Microsoft have threatened at times to move production facilities abroad if the H-1B program of visas for temporary engineers and so on is not sustained and even expanded. And that is why we are receiving today close to half a million uh, uh, professionals, uh, software programmers, engineers, and their families every year. Think about that, half a million. While chambers of commerce and other employers organizations have remained indifferent to nativist mobilizations and calls for immigration reform, they have swiftly mobilized when their foreign labor supply has really seriously been threatened. The history of immigrant legislation and attempts at immigration reform in America is replete, is replete with instances in which legislative initiatives to constrain or regulate foreign labor flows have been effectively bypassed by the timely intervention of these lobbies. Uh, the swift reenactment, but instant reenactment by the federal government of the H2B, H2 visa program to counteract the drying up of unauthorized immigration during the last, during the last years that is corresponding to the last recession stands as the latest illustrations of this consistent trends. That is, from one day to the next, as it were, the H2 program that had been moribund and nobody had just had was, was reactivated and visas were, going, were started to be uh, granted on a massive scale such that by 2010, uh, up, up to 400,000 H2 visas were granted uh, by the federal government reaching a similar level of of, of uh, foreign uh, temporary workers that have been reached at the top of the old Bracero program. So we are back uh, in the same, and the country effectively has a new temporary labor program for agriculture and so on, prompted by the fast mobilization of this, um, a, of, um, of, a, of this agricultural interest. The result of these timely interventions by employer lobbies has been to restore equilibrium between migration's economic benefits and its social costs to an acceptable range, ensuring the continuation of a structurally important labor flow. So that if we were to conceptualize employers and the native working class as sort of game players, if you want to use sort of game theory in, 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 in terms of how the, their interests um, a qualis, we could have, we could construct a, a, a diagram, sort of an ideal typical diagram uh, like this. For native workers, uh, in this case, the ideal, uh, the, the ideal situation would be in cell A that we can call native workers paradise in which, because in that case, theoretically, the employer class would refrain from higher foreign labor. So that there would not be, uh, th that there would not be a problem. Preventive mobilizations against immigration, like in cell C, would imply some cost, but it's still the payoff accruing to native workers in terms of the absence of labor market competition and removal of the foreign presence would be high. 
uh, let me say that the plus and minus sciences, they are represent theoretic ideal, theoretical gains or losses for the native working class or the employer class, the, the ones up to the left accruing to workers, the ones to the right accruing to employers. Neither situation or sales A or C correspond to reality because of the interest and associated knowledge and power of employers. For that class, the most desirable outcome would be cell B. Uh, but uh, this cell that, um, that, that is here, that's, that's a, that would be the ideal outcome for employers, being able to hire foreign labor without resistance. But this outcome is also unrealistic given the impossibility of keeping the, the native population entirely quiescent. And therefore, the gain, if you like, converges in cell D. And cell D in which, though not ideal for employers, they, are, they still benefit at the expense of greater comp competition and general unease among, natives, among uh, native workers and their advocates. Um, then these cells, in a sense, represent an ideal, typical ref uh, reflection of the situation we face in this country today. This is essentially, that's where the gain converges in cell D, where you have, the, that is, employers keep bringing labor on, on their series of temporary uh, programs and arrangements, and there is opposition to it at the, uh, at the level of the, uh, at least a, a large portion of the native working class. So this diagram is there to, port to try to, uh, to portray the real situation of political economy. The reason why labor continues, that is foreign labor continues coming, but both at the top and at the bottom of the labor market is because it's needed. It's a structurally needed by the American economy. It could, that is the high tech sector of the American economy could not function without massive influxes of, um, of foreign, uh, of highly skilled foreign uh, labor and the bottom and industries depend that are labor intensive and depending on large uh, flows of labor could n such as agriculture could not exist without it. So that is the reality. And that, conf the, that, is a, that conflicts with the perceptions at the surface leading to these situations and to uh, this context that, uh, that eventually converge here. But that is not, that's what, that is in a sense half of the story why uh, policies derived from the two ideologies that I mentioned at the start of this talk tend to have consequences that are the opposite of those intended or that are, tend to be contradictory. So what is the other half? What are the other forces? The second reason why nativist campaigns and the implementation of uh, measures derived from them uh, tend to backfire is rooted less in political economy, which is this diagram, than in politics per se. Mobiliz and the reason why is that mobilizations against immigrants and ethnic minor minorities do not occur in a vacuum. While at the start, first generation immigrants may lack the information and the organizational resources to counteract such attacks, that situation does not last for long. In time, <coughs> either immigrants themselves or their children manage to acquire voice, mobilizing to defend their identities and prevent them to be attacked with such impunity. Minority political movements are, can be actually very powerful because unlike those in the general population, they tend to be focused, focused on a few specific targets, like the defense, uh, stopping deportations, defending uh, bilingual education, preventing discrimination. So anti-immigrant measures often turn against their proponents. And it is worth recalling uh, some of these experiences so that I can, that as illustrations of the point uh, to be made. For example, Proposition 187 in California that I mentioned today, the Save Our State uh, a proposition in 1987 was widely perceived as anti-immigrant and anti-Mexican 
leading to a massive political mobilization of the Hispanic population. As a consequence of that mobilization, proponents of 187 lost their congressional seats in California or faded from political life, a fate ultimately befalling the measure's most ardent advocate, governor, the former governor Pete Wilson of California that faded from view after, uh, after the, the, that massive mobilization. Uh, defeated politicians are often replaced by members of the very ethnic or immigrant group that they, uh, that they attacked before, as happened in California with the election of Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez, a daughter of Mexican immigrants who defeated a six-term six Republican incumbent in Orange County, uh, former Congressman Bob Dorna. So basically, these were the advocates of 187 and they lost their jobs. And they didn't lose their jobs in a vacuum. They lost their jobs because they triggered a massive mobilization from the grassroots directed, uh, directed uh, that it is straight uh, against them. And the same story has been repeated, has repeated itself in a number of, in a number of settings. For example, uh, in the wake of the anti-bilingual referendum that was passed by the, f by, the f by the South Florida population in 1980, there, there occurred a swift political mobilization by Cuban Americans uh, in that region, which before had not mobilized politically for domestic causes, and that in a few years basically did away with the all Anglo political establishment in South Florida. In today's uh, political situation in that area, it is scarcely worthwhile to run for, for office if you're not Cuban American. That came out out of the, uh, of the reaction to the anti-bilingual referendum before there was no problem and had not happened before. These episodes have as a fundamental background, of course, the resilience of the American constitutional order that simultaneously prevents the majority from doing violence to the minority, from imposing its will by force, although some people try to do it, think of the Ku Klux Klan and other militant native organizations, but overall, the American constitutional order and legal system prevents this from happening and endowed the minority with the opportunity, at least, to manifest, to articulate their views through the electoral process, that is through elections and so on. Arguably, the most recent and most telling manifestation of these dynamics uh, was the 2012 presidential election. Prior to it, Prior 2012, if you recall, uh, uh, nativist advocates from Lou Dobbs in CNN to all kinds of uh, similar spokespersons in the academic uh, world and the press acted as if they had the political field to themselves, piling measure after measure and attack after attack on the immigrant population. Dobbs mentioned in one of his uh, that, that immigrants were carrying leprosy from Mexico to the United States. That was one of his uh, uh, most interesting attacks. And, uh, and things of that sort that were pretty, uh, a pretty extreme were uh, voiced without any kind of uh, res restraint because there was a, a sense that, they, that in voicing this, they reflected the general opinion they had the, vo the feel to themselves. Well, think again. Uh, that is, they, they did not count on the reaction of the Hispanic elector electorate that uh, fueled by this and mobilized uh, by their, their own media uh, went to the polls in 2012 in record numbers inflicting a decisive defeat on many of the very politicians who had attacked their culture their, their language and their identity with so much impunity in the past. Every year today, 900,000 young Hispanics reach voting age in the United States. Think about this, only a million, o almost a million. So that while they will, they will form by no means an homogeneous voting bloc, they, they can be counted to vote solidly against anti-bilingual and racist measures and their proponents. And that, so that what happened in 2012 will happen again. It is not, uh, it is 
uh, impossible to set back the clock on these political forces. Relations between the native majority, majority and an immigrant minority can also be portrayed ideal typical in another of these little diagrams. And I like to use them because they serve to sort of summarize a complex reality in some ideal cells in which you can sort of you can take home and sort of reflect about it. Cell A in this diagram here represents an ideal situation where the native, na the native population would be tolerant of foreign groups and the foreign groups in turn would concern themselves with their own business of moving ahead and not mobilize politically. They would simply move, tr try to uh, improve their lot individually and so on. Cell B is practically empty. It's labeled preemptive mobilization, but the fact of the matter is that very few that immigrant minorities seldom mobilize preemptively. Uh, when they are not attacked. If they, that is, if there is a tolerant attitude among the native majority and so on, people concern themselves with their own business and seldom organize and so on. So that cell is kind of empty. There are some examples among uh, immigrant entrepreneurs that mobilize preemptively, but they are exceptional. More interesting are the other two cells, cell C and cell D. Cell C ushers the start of anti-immigrant mobilization and campaigns where milligram, militant nativism has the feel to itself. In that situation, when targeted minorities are defenseless because they have no voice like the undocumented and so on, there is no limit to the groundless accusations that are leveled against them. When the, the field is left in this situation, the, the kinds of attacks and accusations about what they bring and why, why they harm the national, the, the, the culture, the society and so on, have no limit. The simple and erroneous expectation of these of native voices in that situation is that their mobilization would lead directly to a change in government policy, prevent further immigration, expel the unauthorized and force remaining immigrants to assimilate as quickly as, pos as possible. But the fact of the matter is that reality does not converge in cell C, but in cell D. So because repeated attacks against a minority, today and in the past, this happens, this also happened at the beginning of the 20th century when immigrants were attacked initially with so much impunity that eventually they had to organize and defend themselves and create movements. That's what, that's what led the Irish to rise, in, to, rise to power in, in municipal and, the, and later on in national politics. That, that's what led to the Italian and Polish mobilizations and so on. And the same thing is happening today. Basically what you have is this convergence in which such attacks, uh, with time, these mobilizations grow in strength incorporating not only members of, of the second generation, the children of immigrants, but liberal and progressive ma mainstream groups appalled by nativist attacks. The results, as we have seen, is likely to be the opposite of, the, of those intended. That is, this, these measures promoting exclusion and, uh, and deportation and so on eventually lead to the opposite, then because of reactive mobilization by the, by the population uh, so challenge. Cell D corresponds fairly well to the present political scenario in the country in which the demonization of immigrants, particularly Mexicans, have led to a series of harsh measures and legislative proposals that have been in turn countered by a reactive vote by the Hispanic electorate. Added to the underlying context of economic interest between employers and segments of the native working class that we saw before, the situation has evolved today into a political impasse where contradictory policies are allowed to continue, leading to mostly negative out out uh, outcomes. Anti-immigrant and anti-bilingual anti uh, policies can be counted to help the Democratic Party nationwide precisely because of this process of reactive mobilization and in areas where the Hispanic population concentrates. So uh, it, is, it is almost a certainty that the continuation of such measures and policies would lead 
to a, a spirit of mobilization of a growing Hispanic vote in the areas where it concentrates. On the other hand, congresspersons that are elected from mostly white districts where there are relatively few members of the minority can be expected, however, to continue supporting these anti-bilingual and anti-immigrant policies leading to the present impasse in which one branch of government is trying to do something and the opposite branch is trying to do the opposite because of this. So that impasse in which we, we face ourselves has political, uh, has political roots in this kind of contest that is uh, sort of a, a ideal typically portrayed uh, in this diagram. The disconnect between public perceptions of migration and the realities underneath in the political economy of the country and in its politics, uh, the resulting inefficient equilibrium between the interests of employers and the wishes of nativists, and the emergence of reactive ethnic militants in response to anti-immigrant mobilizations provide the background for the present state of American immigration policies. And understanding these realities summarizing that in this diagram is the first step to try to approach, to try to reach a more rational and more effective approach to, uh, to the continuation of immigration and, and to its handling. There is a better way. There is a better way. And it consists in bringing the unauthorized population above ground and then regulating it in collaboration with governments of sending countries, primarily Mexico, this flow can be, can be managed and controlled, turning what is today a gigantic uh, a, a quasi-criminal problem and police problem into, into a simple labor management uh, problem. The resurrected H2 program uh, goes some distance toward that goal. That's what we have today. We have a de facto uh, partial uh, mig migration program, but with severe limitations. More promising, actually, was the immigration reform proposal that was passed by the U.S. Senate in 2012, although it was weighted down by unnecessary punitive provisions, and eventually and ultimately it, it did not succeed because it was not because of opposition by uh, conservatives in, in Congress. So here is an alternative proposal that takes into account the real forces at play underlying migration and that I, I have tried to summarize for you. First, set up a temporary labor permit program. Every foreign laborer with a certifiable work contract in the United States can cross the border legally upon payment of $2,000, which is about two-thirds of the estimated cost for hiring a professional smuggler at the border today. That permit will be valid for three years and renewable for another three. Upon return to their countries, migrants will get half of their entry payment plus their, accumulation soci plus their accumulated social security contributions. As an, as an incentive to return. That can be paid back in, by banks in the country uh, of origin. Since they will not retire in the United States because they are temporary program, there is no point in, uh, in, not, in, in withdrawing social security contributions from their paychecks and then not returning them to, to them, which is what's happening at now. I think so the social security program uh, the Social Security Administration today is significantly subsidized by social security deductions taken from workers that will never, are never going to cash in by retiring in this country. So this works well in terms of justice and will also would work well as an, intense, as an incentive for temporary, labor wor labor, uh, temporary workers to uh, return home. The program will be initially capped at one million per year, which is commensurate with the estimated size of the undocumented labor flow prior to the 2008 recession. Uh, for the, then, that's part of the program. For the estimated 11 million uh, 
unauthorized immigrants that are already in the United States and that, that comprise that cast at the bottom of the labor market, uh, which uh, and the main source of contention between the different forces at play that we have seen, a special regularization program will be set up contingent on payment of the same entry fee and the absence of a criminal record. And they will receive the same three-year temporary work permit, again, renewable for another three. Contrary to the demonization of these immigrants as lawbreakers, uh, this measure would redefine them as economic actors that essentially were responding to labor incentives in the American economy, but had no legal means to arrive before because there was no channel to, to, uh, to prevent them to respond to the economic incentives put before them. Finally, the US government will support governments of sending countries, especially that of Mexico, that in exchange for legal access for their migrants to the American labor market will implement a special health education and job training programs for the families of new immigrants back home. These programs will also work as an incentive for these families to remain at home and for migrants to return. And finally, for migrants that wish to stay in the United States after these six years uh, uh, of temporary work, there will be a special pass for permanent residence. That path will be contingent on absence of a criminal record, proof of employment, and economic solvency. So basically, this is a proposal for a legal temporary labor program, reproducing what is, ha what is happening already with the H-1B program at the, top of the of, at the top of the labor market, but to meet the needs of the, lab of the labor intensive indus industries at the bottom, depending or dependent on foreign labor without having to criminalize uh, those workers and to, having, without having to subject, so to subject them then to the terrible situations of deportations and so on once they arrive in response to economic incentives that were here. Now, for, uh, you are going to find many critics of legal temporary labor programs. One of my colleagues, uh, one, uh, at the University of California says that there is not, nothing more permanent than a temporary foreign worker. And for economists, there is that kind of belief. But that, the reason for that is that in the past, most of these te temporary labor programs have been poorly managed. And we can learn from those lessons and, and create programs that work for the benefit of the receiving country in the sense of contributions, the contributions of laborers, of migrants, and for the benefit of the sending country in the sense of continuing to receive the remittances, the, the, no, the accumulated know-how and the energies of return migrants after a period of time, something that, is, that can be readily implemented. And if necessary, during the Q&A questions, I could defend uh, that point further. But at this point, let me say that for legal temporary workers to work, three conditions must be met. First, workers should be free to change employers after a period of time. One of the main drawbacks of the old Bracero program in the United States and of the current H-2 program and the H-1B-2 is that they condition legal residence in the country to the will and the consent of one employer, the original employer. So the worker, be, be he a, or she a professional or a manual uh, uh, ranch hand, are tied to the will of a single employer that can, on, on, on a whim, sort of get uh, a call in the authorities and get him, get the migrant out of the country. This situation of tying migrants to a single employer gives hiring firms excessive power to the point of rendering the migrants' labor rights practically null. So what I, what, what I would propose is that after a certain period, a period of three to six months, temporary workers should be free to change employers. That would ride the balance of power between workers and their employers, giving, and also give hiring firms an incentive to treat their workers better, because if not, they would walk, uh, which would be a, 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 a actually a, a rather good thing. Second, there should be, temp there should be voluntary incentives to return. 
while migrant workers will undoubtedly prefer to hold legal status in the United States, some may be motivated to, to stay after the le the, their legal contract is up. Punitive measures against such individuals will not work. They, did n they have not worked with, those that, with the 11 million who are here, and they did not work in Europe. At the end of the guest worker program, they are in instead creating massive populations of immigrants that then brought their families. Uh, not only they remain, but they brought their families, as happened with the tur massive Turkish migration to Germany and the massive Algerian and other North African migration to France. For these reasons, enforcement should be coupled with incentives to return both in the home, in the host and the home countries. And this return of the social security contribution and return of the original, uh, as well as programs implemented by the sending country governments uh, would go a long way to provide voluntary incentives for people, for migrants to return. And however, despite incentives to return, Temporary labor programs inevitably create a sediment of migrants wishing to stay for one or another reason. That is impossible, that is, that is inevitable. Always there will, there will be a sediment of people who want to stay, why? Because they got married or they established a situation or they want to stay and so on. And therefore, it, rather than blocking so, such persons uh, that would risk a return to creating another, another bottom, uh, another mass of undocumented workers uh, they create another unauthorized population, it is preferable to create a path to legal entry. That is at the end of six years to provide a path for a toward through which such persons can legalize their stay in the country. As I come to the end of this talk, the, the logical question that you may, you may uh, consider is what the future holds. What, what is going to happen? Uh, uh, both for the nation and for its immigrant uh, population. The problem is that I cannot answer that very well. Uh, sociology and the social sciences in general have, been, have not been very good at predicting major events in the past. Indeed, the literature in the social sciences is littered with failed predictions of what the next big bang was going to, is going to happen, and so I am not, I'm certainly not going to risk it. It would be very risky to attempt to anticipate whether or not major immigration reform will pass the US Congress, or which will be the next country or countries to satisfy this nation's insatiable need for foreign labor. But if we cannot predict big events, events as such, there are two other phenomena that we can anticipate with a, a measure, of, with some measure of certainty, uh, with a reasonable degree of confidence, a steady states and trends. This is so because both phenomena, unlike events, are extended over time and both possess a past dependent character, so you can sort of anticipate what is happening. There are two major steady states that can be anticipated at present with a reasonable degree of confidence. First, the continuation of immigration despite nativist resistance, and second, the continuation of the struggle over immigration and immigrant assimilation. Both of these that I have related are, can be expected to continue in the future. Both are anticipated by the D cells in the two diagrams that I presented to you, uh, the, the continuing requirement for, uh, for foreign labor by firms at both ends of the American economy pretty much ensures that these flows will continue despite nativist denunciations and attacks. We are not going to have an employer paradise in this country, but we will have a continuous, albeit contested, inflow of foreign workers, professionals and technicians at one end, and semi-skilled and unskilled workers at the other because of the structural needs of this $14 trillion economy, larger than the aggregated sum of all Western Europe. The second, sta the second steady state is, the, is just the continuation of the historical rivalry between the foreign-born population and its native enemies. 
As we show in the last figure, Navy's exclusionary campaigns seldom succeed and often backfire, not only because of the economic interests of employers, but also because they trigger a strong opposition among the groups that are so attacked. This outcome has never prevented uh, nativists from trying again, seeking again and again to scare the native population and to mobilize it against, quote, the foreign peril. Many have profited handsomely from some stoking up and scaring these fears, and therefore that's why uh, uh, th that's why the why political reality has seldom converged in peaceful cell A, where there would be native uh, tolerance toward the foreign presence, but rather on its opposites. Finally, those those were the steady state. The trends are actually more interesting because they adumbrate the likelihood of future social change in this country and those that send immigrants to it. The three are particularly, three trends are particularly important. First, the gradual spread of the immigrant pop presence to all regions of the country, to the entire nation. Second, the growing political power of the foreign origin population uh, at, at election time. And third, the eventual end of Mexican migration. It is worth emphasizing that the growing political influence of the foreign origin population is a done deal. This is a fait accompli. That is, even if there were no more immigration to the country, which is not going to happen because there is going to be, even if, if there, there would be no, no more immigration to the country, the, the forces at play are already here. That is, they are already in place and uh, it does, it do not, they do not depend on the continuation of immigration, although this is likely to happen anyway. During the last two decades, the growth of the Hispanic population of the United States has been driven primarily by birth to, uh, to, uh, to women already in the United States. That is by native birth. Between 2000 and 2016, the majority of the growth of the Hispanic population, now numbering close to 60 million, was due to the, the birth in already in the country, not to immigration. Naturally, the passage of time will bring about the maturation of a, of a second generation children of immigrants, increasingly numerous and ready to enter the political arena. Almost one million per year are doing so at the present time. This near inevitable trend will significantly alter the balance of political power at election time. Long distance migration is a path dependent process governed by the growth and the consolidation of social networks across the space. And these networks will ensure the continuation of Mexican immigration in the short to the medium term. But over time, already existing demographic and macroeconomic forces in Mexico will take over. Uh, leading to the end of the Mexican flood. This is anticipated to happen around 2030 because of rapidly declining fertility in Mexico, the growth of the Mexican population, increasing opportunities there, and uh, sort of the, the end of the situation that drove so many to come here. What will happen then? What will happen then? Who will be, what will, what will be the next country? That, from, that will be tapped to feed in this insatiable hunger for uh, a low skill migration. Unlike technolo un unless technology delivers the unlikely miracle of complete replacement of workers by machines in agriculture, construction, industry, and personal services, new sources of labor must be found. That is something to think about. As long, terms, as long terms of servers of immigration, their fourth edition of my book on Immigrant America since the 1990s, my, my colleagues and I, and we have seen changes cascade rather than trickle in each of the passing uh, decades. In all probability, the future will mirror this past, bringing about the consolidation of the three trends that I have mentioned to you, and along with them, a new page, a radical new page in the complex and often surprising history of this nation of immigrants. Thank you very much.
talk a little bit about your team. <coughs> sure, good question. A couple of questions, anybody? That's, that's, a very, that's a very strategic question. It's a, it's a, it's a practical question, how do you do this? And I, let's say on this that uh, the minorities that exist in the country, as you have mentioned, are many. This is a, a country that is structured al al along a ethnic racial hierarchy that permeates everything. But the mi that minorities uh, in the country have had different origins. That is the, the, the large African area. African American population gave its origins to slavery. And it creates a situation in which this is a real ethnic group. It's a group that has had a common history, a common destiny, and that have and that rose together in the 1960s because of the oppression of the past to claim its place in the sun with the consequence of the human rights of legislation that allowed the creation of a black middle class and the and the partial movement although that is an agenda that is still very incomplete. The Hispanics are a different story. Hispanics are a folk ethnic group. Uh, that is because Hispanics come from many different countries. Some of them have been in the country before the country was a, a state, like those in New Mexico and so on. Others arrived yesterday. They come from many different nationalities and so on. Nevertheless, despite the fact that, 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 the, that Hispanic is a census expression rather than a real ethnic group, they, the, one of the interesting consequences of the native mobilizations against immigrants and the deportation campaigns and so on has been to bring a group that did not exist into reality. It is increasingly Hispanics of very different ilk, Cubans from, from South Florida to Mexicans in California voted in reaction to this measure. So one of the things that why these native uh, measures blow in the face of their proponents is one in, in part strengthening the solidarity among different groups. Even the Asian vote in the 2012 election was monolithic uh, in opposition to the Republican Party because they've seen it as a, that is seeing the more conservative elements as opposed to all immigrants, not, o not only to Hispanics. So that, the, that in a sense is the, uh, a, is the background where we find today. But precisely because these, these different minorities come, have very different history, one has to proceed with caution in order to, in, in order to, move, uh, to move forward because it's not the same. That is, there are different interests and so on. Nevertheless, I would argue that uh, there, is a, there is considerable room for mutual support in terms of the causes that are of interest to African Americans on the one hand, to Mexican Americans on the other, and even to Asians uh, on the other, in the sense of uh, gaining their place in the sun, greater that is greater opportunity for their children, and a reduction of the uh, of the level of racism and racial hierarchies in the nation. And I think that one can be optimistic because, despite the fact that one that you hear voices uh, uh, time and again that. Uh, Mexicans are taking jobs away from blacks, and, and there have been an, a sort of campaigns to put both groups to, in a sense, in a collision course. That has not happened. That has not happened massively. On the other, on, that is, there have not been massive cooperation, but there have been more cooperation than opposition. And, in, and that is, in a sense, a platform from which suitable progressive alliances that eliminates some of the most, uh, that is the most uh, outrageous uh, 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 manifestations of racism against different groups, the shooting of 
uh, of, uh, of young black people by the police, on the one hand, the massive deportation of, of workers who are, that is, who have had families in the US and are deported, on the other, these kinds of outrages can, uh, can, be, we can be reduced through, uh, through the electoral pro process, through an increasing acquisition of political power and solidarity. You can see in this pl this plan was a first step. The, the 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 small print of the law is not there. One would have to work around it. But one would imagine that absence of a criminal record does not mean um, having a having a traffic offense, for example, or being stopped for a, for running a red light and so on. It means felony. That is absence of a, of a serious criminal record that, that, that would imply this, not, not just being stopped by the police for uh, running a stop sign or something like that. So that's obvious. Uh, and that, that occurs today even in the process of acquiring U.S. permanent residence or citizenship. That is for applicants to citizenship, absence of a permanent record of a, of a criminal record means absence of felony. Felony that for which people can be will be convicted for uh, for prison time or things that is that is what is what absence of a criminal record and that of, that occurs both to and that would occur both to the uh, would be a, a condition for legalization of um, of unauthorized workers and uh, this 11 million that exists at present as well as for the granting of legal permanent residence after the six years six years of temporary work that I have mentioned before. Let me uh, use the occasion before, while I have you all here, and before we, uh, we go out to, um, to, to very things, so let, 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 me be, let me keep you here a little longer, despite the, to say the following. Many people are, are, ex ex that is, are uh, skeptical about the possibility of a temporary labor program to work, to function. And they think that it's not that everybody's going to, that they think that primarily everybody, all these temporary workers are going to stay here after they, after they are allowed into the country. Not true, not true at all. The evidence of the two temporary labor programs that work, that have operated in time, show exactly the opposite. The, the Bracero program is based on an agreement between the U.S. and the Mexican government to bring rural, rural workers from Mexico and so on. was pretty tough because actually the Bracero, that is the migrants who came under that program were attached to a single employer. They didn't have the freedom to go on. Despite that, despite their problems and exploitations and so on, very few Braceros remain. The bulk of the Bracero, of, of the Mexican Braceros that came to the program returned to Mexico and their families at the end of the period. In part because they knew that they could come back uh, in another year and so on, it became a regular issue and that did not depopulate 
the Swedish and, and towns where they came from that did not bring in their families and friends. The 11 million that are here at present is a direct consequence of, the, of another policy that, that, that blew up on the face of the Stockholm. We want to militarize the border to prevent further undocumented immigrants who are coming because they're responding to the labor needs of the American economy and are stopped at the border. Well, they keep coming because they are still responding to the same economic incentives. But once they come, they don't go back because if during the Bracero program, they would easily go back. Now, when they come, they stay because they don't want to pay another $3,000. And not only that, they bring their families. So it's you created in the United States the very same outcome that this militarization of the border was intended to avoid. The other example is in Europe. The guest worker program for gas car buyers in Europe worked perfectly well while it was, temp that it, it was temporary. Turkish workers and Algerian workers went back home after their period of time and because they knew that they could return at some point and so on, so there was no problem with that. The problem started when the, when the temporary program ended. When, they, when, it, was, when it was stopped, the, the naive expectation of the part of the, of the German and French government were that the Turks would go back and the Algerians will all go back. The opposite happened, they stayed and then they brought the family. So you created exactly what you, inte what you intended to avoid. Temporary programs do work, and properly managed, man, are a, 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 or properly managed are a, a boon both to the economies of the receiving country because of the labor input that they provide for different sectors of the economy, and to the sending one in terms not only of the remittances but the know-how and the investments that can be made by migrants once they return. Thank you very much. Sorry to keep you. Thank you, brother. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it. I want you to also uh, thank Maxi, who is our co-sponsor, for bringing us a very challenging audience as well. Uh, we will be moving to the uh, lobby for a few minutes if you want to take a little of an interchange for the next 20 minutes or so. I, Benito, we have some libations there, Paula? Is that? Okay. <laughs> So thank you for attending this event, and please sign, sign up so we can uh, keep in touch in the future.